All right, and next I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Elaine Mills. Elaine is a Master Gardener from the class of 2012. She's one of the leads at our demonstration garden, um, the Glen Carlin Library Community Garden. Um, she's also a member of the social media committee and she developed the tried and true fact sheets with um, another Master Gardener. And um, uh, Elaine participates in so many, um, so many parts of our program, it's incredible. She's also on our um, mentoring committee and she's one of our wonderful speakers. I see we have lots of folks joining us today and I'm sure that is in great part due to Elaine's skill with these presentations. So Elaine, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Leslie. Welcome everyone to today's joint presentation by Virginia Cooperative Extension and Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. We'll be talking about native ground covers for sun and shade. To give you a quick overview of today's talk, first we'll be answering the questions, what are ground covers? Where can they be used? What functions do they serve? I'll talk about a few problems with invasive species of ground covers and the benefits of using native species as alternatives. And the great bulk of the talk will be actually introducing you to specific native ground covers, 20 plants for sun, 20 plants for shade, and four plants that can go between those two conditions. We'll be stopping at several points uh, to take your questions. Colleen will be helping with that. Uh, at the very end, I'll give you a few resources and take some final questions. So what are ground covers? Well, generally, traditionally, people think of them as plants with a creeping and spreading habit used to cover sections of ground and requiring minimal maintenance. But today, I would like to introduce you to some other categories of plants. They won't necessarily grow close to the ground, but they can, in fact, cover ground. Some are perennials, some are ferns. I will also speak about a few grasses, sedges, and rushes. And finally, there are even some woody plants, some shrubs and vines that can fill this ground cover function. Where can they be used? Well, one place is where turf doesn't grow well. Uh, also on slopes or other areas that are difficult to mow. They can be used as edging in borders and along paths, under shrubs and trees, even between some paving stones. They can be used in wide uh, ranges of conditions, some in the so-called hell strips, those hot, dry, curbside locations, and the, uh, those that prefer moisture would be perfect for rain gardens. And they serve uh, a wide variety of functions. If you have a multi-layered garden, they can be part of that ground layer. You can reduce maintenance in your garden by using these plants as a kind of green mulch. Some of them can actually serve as a lawn alternative, relieving you of all of these extra, extra tasks, seeding and mowing and fertilizing, aerating. Uh, these ground covers can cool the ground and help retain moisture for your other plants. They can reduce soil compaction and erosion and filter and slow rainfall from, for stormwater management. And finally, they can add beauty and interest to a garden. Unfortunately, there uh, are many currently very popular ground covers that are in fact invasive. They are widely available in many of the box stores and the, the big chain nurseries and even recommended by landscapers. Colleen pointed out to me how even the uh, famous a, a garden columnist, Adrian Higgins, in his very recent column in the Washington Post, was recommending uh, among ground, various ground covers, several invasive species. Uh, I'd like to point out, for those of you who are residents of Arlington County and Alexandria, those two jurisdictions have uh, actually listed these particular ground covers, very popular ground covers you'll recognize here as invasive. For those of you who may be attending for, from more remote locations, these ground covers are actually uh, considered to be invasive uh, throughout a good part of the East Coast. Now, uh, a juga, bugleweed, isn't actually considered 
uh, an invasive plant, but it can be problematic when you have it close to your landscape beds or to the lawn where it can just uh, in, infest that area and be very hard to remove. So what are the problems? Uh, why are these call, referred to as invasive plants? Well, they don't just remain in our cultivated garden beds. They can uh, spread and invade the understory and canopy areas of uh, natural forests. And when they're there, they can continue to spread both by seeds and rampant vegetative growth. And when they do that, they end up pr producing dense monocultures, which suppress the uh, herbaceous native plants. Some of them, like English ivy, can even climb, smother, and kill trees. Uh, some of them have rhizomes that allow them to travel great distances, even under cement oil that prevents the successful growth of other plants that surround them. Some of them can even reroot from very small root fragments. Others can harbor rats or diseases, and all of them are difficult to eradicate. Now, to make things really clear for you um, exactly what invasiveness means, these are non-native species. They are introduced into a new environment, primarily by human actions. And when they do that, they significantly modify or disrupt the ecosystems that they're colonizing. Um, in addition to the environmental harm that they may cause, they can also cause problems for the economy or for human health. So I'm today going to be talking about native ground covers, and here are some of the benefits of using those. First of all, they're suited to our local soil and climate conditions. Some of them may be aggressive, and I will point those out, but they are not invasive. They're not going to cause uh, econ economic harm or environmental harm to our natural areas. And most importantly, they have evolved with local fauna. They can provide nectar and pollen for our pollinators. The foliage of these plants uh, can provide nutrition for Lepidoptera, the butterflies, fritillaries, and moths. They can provide fruit and seeds, some of them for wildlife, and some of them offer cover for a variety of animals. In other words, in addition to, to providing beauty, these ornamental qualities, they are really uh, providing for life in the garden, they, the ongoing uh, succession of all of our, of our fauna. So before we get started, I wanted to quickly mention, I hope most of you have already received uh, a two-page handout which I prepared. This uh, at the very top uh, provides the list of the, of the invasive ground covers for Arlington and Alexandria. And then uh, I break down a further uh, the listing of plants for sun and for shade. And I give you both the common names and the scientific names, the Latin names. The reason for that is that many of the native plant nurseries will actually sell them by using these names. And my hope is that you can use this list as we go through the talk. You can make notes on plants that are of interest to you. And then you could actually take this, if you wish, along with you to um, a native plant nursery and use that as the proper identification for buying your plants. So let's get started because I've got a lot of plants to tell you about. Uh, we'll begin first with low growing native perennials for sun. And this category of plants are those that are under one foot. So the first one is the snow flurry cultivar of heath aster. Many of you may be familiar with the th airy three foot tall species of heath aster, but this is a prostrate form. It's very dense, almost woody and branching. And when it spreads out, it will really choke out weeds. Uh, it's only about four to six inches high, but it will spread across about two feet. And as you can see, it likes uh, sunny, dry conditions. Now, uh, for all of the the plants I'll be talking about, I've created these little text boxes. I won't be necessarily uh, speaking aloud all of the facts that I'm listing here, but I'll try to highlight some of the most important and unique characteristics. 
And I know one category that people are concerned about is deer resistance. And so I will be pointing out, in this case, the young leaves may be nibbled by deer. Most of the plants are, in fact, deer resistant. Although our extension agent, uh, Kirsten Comrade, likes to point out that deer resistant plants are resistant to some deer some of the time. But in general, they, they are fairly deer resistant. So here's what uh, the snow flurry flowers look like. Very abundant flowers. They're just coming into flower now, late summer to mid fall. Great for using uh, in border fronts or rock gardens. And I've actually used it as kind of a ground cover, the spiller layer in um, a large pot with some native plants. Uh, the next example of a low-growing perennial is moss phlox, phlox subulata. And this plant is actually pretty widely available in the general horticulture trade. This is a dense mat-forming plant, a little bit taller than the other and also spreading pretty uh, far and wide. It's uh, very good because it's tolerant of drought and poor soil and is evergreen. It blooms in March to May, available in many colors, and it's valuable because it provides nectar and pollen early in the season for butterflies and our sphinx moths. It has these evergreen needle-like leaves that form a dense carpet and help to stabilize soil. It's really attractive when you drape it over a wall. You could also use it for edging in a rock garden, a water-wise garden, or for erosion control. And it's a great replacement for the non-native invasive periwinkle. Some of you may be surprised to learn that we have uh, a native East Coast uh, cactus, Eastern prickly pear, Opuntia humofusa. This is a low-growing cactus, again, for uh, full sun and dry conditions. It's easy to grow. You can actually take the pads and just stick them into the ground and they will root. And the one important thing to note is you'll want to handle them with care. You'll want to wear gloves. They have both these thorns and little uh, glockids, these little uh, barbs that uh, appear in various places on the pads. And if you wear gloves, you can protect your hands from uh, getting pricked from those. Prickly pear flowers in June to July, attracting bees and butterflies. The pads are edible by humans and animals, as well as the fruits that are referred to as tunas. And this would be a great plant to use in a rock or water-wise garden, as well as in hot hell strips, those, those uh, drought, uh, drought conditions uh, right beside a curb. One of my favorite low-growing perennials is plant and leaf pussy toes, Antenaria plantaginifolia. This is a mat forming plant and it uh, spreads by stolons, little uh, above ground uh, roots. This is another great plant for full sun and it really requires lean, dry soil. It tolerates drought and black walnut. It starts out with these woolly grayish leaves. They uh, uh, provide uh, nourishment for the American painted lady butterfly. Then a little bit later in spring, they will form these 10 inch tall flower stalks. And eventually these charming flowers that look almost like kitten's paws, um, giving them their name. These flowers will appear and they will attract small bees and uh, native flies. They will spread uh, over a period of time to form a, a dense weedless mass. And I, this is a picture in my garden. I use them as an edging. Uh, they actually can tolerate uh, light foot traffic and would be a great substitute for invasive creeping jenny. This is another plant I use quite a bit in my garden. In fact, uh, Almost all of these plants I've either grown myself or have uh, used in the Glen Carlin uh, community garden, or I've seen them uh, widely used in various public gardens and photographed them there. So this plant has a mounded form, uh, a little bit taller than the other plants. Um, it, it tends to like uh, full to part sun conditions, and it, it will tolerate some uh, drought and rocky soil. It begins with these basal leaves and then these abundant tubular flowers. It's just completely covered with flowers uh, from April to May. So this is another important early nectar source 
for a wide variety of pollinators. I use it uh, as an edging in my garden, could also be used in rock gardens. And this plant began just as one mound and over uh, one or two seasons, I was able to propagate it very easily and, and get quite a few plants. Uh, the nice thing is that it spreads from these ground level stems to make a, a pretty continuous mass and it's evergreen in our fairly mild winters. Another example of a low growing perennial is blue eyed grass. And this particular grass is actually not a grass. Uh, the, this particular plant is not a grass. It's actually a member of the iris family. Uh, this plant grows in dense tufted, tufted clumps and it will spread a little bit further, uh, a little bit taller and spreads uh, a little bit further than some of the others. You'll want to have this one in moister soil and it can self-seed in ideal conditions. It has narrow short uh, sword shaped leaves that are similar to uh, others in the iris genus and has these charming little flowers, little blue flowers in April to May. These are a nectar and pollen source and they, uh, the seeds that form are eaten by birds. You can use it as a nice edging for borders and pathways. I have it here combined with some of my other native perennials and you could use it, uh, actually let it naturalize in open woods. Moving on to some plants that are a little bit taller, one foot and taller, again for sun. The first of these is lyre leaf sage, salvia lirata. Now, It doesn't spread uh, in the way that, that other, men, uh, other mints do. It spreads by self-seeding. Uh, it's an upright plant and it's a clumping plant. It grows about one to two feet tall and it's a very tough plant. You can use it in a wide variety of conditions. It tolerates all of the uh, suburban and, and urban conditions. It begins with this basal rosette of deeply lobed leaves. Uh, they're evergreen and they have this uh, very attractive purple tinging in the winter. Then in April to June, it will form these uh, flower stalks, bringing it to about the one to two foot tall height. And it has uh, nectar for native bees. These very interesting uh, seed stalks form and the seeds are enjoyed by doves. Now, if you didn't want this plant to spread quite so widely, what you would do would just be to, to cut off these uh, seeds before they spread through the garden. So it does reseed. It can form a, a pretty solid evergreen a patch, a, a great ground cover, and it can take both mowing and a, a certain degree of foot traffic. One really attractive cultivar is purple knockout, which has, as you can see, these uh, very attractive purple leaves. Uh, if you want to control it, if it does end up spreading, it's very easily uprooted uh, from these single rosettes and it could be an attractive substitute for non-native ajuga. Robin's plantain, Origeron pulchellus, is actually not a perennial, but because it uh, returns again and again, uh, I've included it here. It's actually a biennial. That's a plant that will have uh, a rosette of leaves in one year, and then it will send up the flowers in the alternating second year. Uh, the flower stalks reach about 18 to 24 inches high. It starts out with this basal rosette of very soft, hairy leaves, kind of a, a grayish green color, and they provide nourishment for several moss species. Then uh, in those alternating years, these uh, showy flowers will appear. These are composite flowers with, with disc flowers in the center and these ray flowers to the side, and they attract a, a variety of pollinators and then form these really cute uh, fluffy seed puffs. They spread to form colonies and can be very useful in borders and rock gardens. And uh, they are evergreen uh, and will have uh, persisting uh, basal rosettes. And uh, one cultivar that's very popular is the Lynn Haven uh, carpet. 
Moving into a, a slightly taller perennial aromatic aster, this can actually reach one to three feet in height. It's bushy, dense, and mounding. And again, another great plant for sunny, dry conditions, tolerating drought, uh, dry soil, rocky soil, poor soil, and largely deer resistant. It has rigid branch stems that help to create that bushy appearance. And the aromatic leaves provide food for a variety of the Lepidoptera caterpillars. It has abundant flowers that will be uh, coming on very, uh, very shortly from September to November. And this is a really important plant uh, for, uh, as a nectar and pollen source. There are two really popular cultivars, the October Skies cultivar, which is somewhat shorter, and Radon's favorite, which has a slightly different flower form and color. And as you can see, they can spread and be used as a kind of a ground cover in a very attractive in mass plantings. And it could be a nice native substitute where you might have used chrysanthemums in the past. This is an example that shows how the plant can actually colonize by stolons. This picture was taken at Brookside Gardens up in Maryland. And so it can be used as a, a great spreading water rise, low maintenance uh, ground cover planting. Clustered Mountain Mint is another member of the mint family. Uh, it is clump forming. It does spread to, uh, to a certain extent by rhizomes, but this one is much easier to control than, than some of the, the uh, non-native mints. You can simply use uh, a spade and uh, chop off uh, the, the roots at a certain point to control where you want them to, to spread and then stop. It has aromatic leaves that can actually be used for tea. And it, again, flowers in this uh, uh, June to September time period, attracting numerous pollinators. And uh, it continues to, uh, to provide great interest in the garden with these, with these very uh, characteristic seed heads. Now, this particular plant uh, was outstanding in some pollinator trials that were run by uh, Penn State Extension a number of years back. And it ranked number one, first for flower longevity, second for the wide diversity of pollinators that it attracted, and third for the greatest number, uh, total number of pollinators that it attracted. So this would be a great plant to use as a ground cover en masse in a butterfly garden. And you can use it uh, for textual, uh, textural contrast in beds and hell strips. Uh, another plant, this I, again, it's in the perennial category, but this one is actually an annual, but it will continue to, to self-seed. In fact, it self-seeds pretty aggressively, so it continue, can continue to remain where you, where you have planted it. The interesting thing about this is that it is a nitrogen-fixing legume. It has these very typical pea-like flowers and uh, seed pods. The, the showy flowers appear from June to October. Again, a great nectar source for the fall for our native bees and butterflies. Now, because of that aggressive spread, you'll want to use it only in certain conditions, but it could be perfect for a meadow setting, uh, using it for erosion control and stabilizing banks. This example is from uh, Longwood Gardens up in Pennsylvania. Threadleaf Coreopsis, Coreopsis verticillata, is a great plant for, uh, for full sun and dry conditions. Uh, and it uh, is a very robust plant, tolerating all of these conditions shown here. We actually use it, and you'll see in one of the upcoming pictures, use it in one of the hell strips at the very front of our sunny demonstration garden. It has a very airy quality, a very fine textured foliage. And these flowers uh, are long blooming from September, excuse me, from June to September. Uh, it's a nectar source for, uh, for our pollinators. And then the seeds that form are enjoyed by birds. It can spread by both rhizomes and self-seeding, but I find it personally very easy to keep within bounds. Here it is shown in our hell strips in the sunny demonstration garden. Here's a lovely example as it's used as an edging plant in a border at uh, Meadowlark Gardens. And a very popular uh, cultivar is Moonbeam. 
with these pale lemon yellow flowers. And finally, for our uh, category of taller perennials, I wanted to point out the solidago species, the goldenrods. These have been uh, selected as uh, highly outstanding by Doug Tallamy, the entomologist and environmentalist who has written so convincingly uh, about the importance of native plants. This particular uh, genus of plants, the goldenrods, are number one for this, their support of pollinators and then as host plants for the Lepidoptera, the butterflies and the, the uh, moths that we would like to see continuing. It's important in a garden to have the nectar plants for our diminishing populations of pollinators. But if we want to see continuing generations of the butterflies, we need to give the adults the nectar, but we need to provide a place for them to lay their eggs so that the caterpillars can succeed for the next generation. So the goldenrods uh, range from about one to, to, excuse me, I put three inches, and that should have been three feet in height. Uh, they can grow from sun to part shade and dry to wet soil conditions. Again, they're a, a top Talamy keystone species. Uh, one of the examples of this goldenrod is rough-stemmed goldenrod and the fireworks cultivar with these plume-like pentacles on very stiff stems is uh, very popular. Uh, I use it here as a ground cover to surround one of my native shrubs. And I'd like to point out that if you end up selecting one of these taller perennials to use in a ground cover function, you can actually control the height of the plant. This is a plant that would maybe grow to about three or four feet up to about this height. But what I do is I pinch it back at several times during the growing season to uh, keep it at this 18 inch height. Um, another of my favorite golden rods is uh, Solidago kesia, blue stemmed golden rod. It has a very delicate uh, branching, uh, arching stem with flowers all along the stem. And this is a great one for more of a, a woodland setting, maybe a, 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 a part sun location. This is a great uh, late nectar source for our pollinators. And a third example is false goldenrod. Uh, the golden fleece cultivar is uh, popular in that category. And it has panicles on very stiff, multi-branched stems. And this one is maybe the most like what you would consider to be a ground cover. It has these rosettes of heart-shaped basal leaves that make a nice mat-like uh, ground cover for rock gardens, meadows, and naturalized areas. So, Colleen, do we have any questions at this point? Uh, we certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, I'm going to start at the beginning. Uh, someone asked, do you recommend or do you have any recommendations for ground covers for like a perennial flower bed, say under um, peonies or something like that? And also, do you have any for a meadow bed? Okay, well, the, 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 the taller ones that, that I mentioned, the, um, if you wanted to use that, uh, that um, chemicrista, the, um, we can go back, go arrowing back through them. The golden rods would be good. Uh, Coreopsis would grow in a meadow type situation. This one, the partridge pea, uh, is, is great for a meadow. Um, when I get a little bit further along to some of the grasses, those would be good for meadow conditions. Now, under, under uh, shrubs, in addition to the low-growing ones I've talked about, like the phlox subulata, the, uh, that moss, the moss phlox, or the, um, the, um, the silene, the, um, this one back, right back here, this um, wild pink, which is really attractive as an edging plant. I'm going to be getting into some other examples of, um, of grasses and, and sedges. And I think you might find some of them really attractive under, uh, under shrubs and trees. Okay, you mentioned uh, lyre leaf sage is good for foot traffic. Are there any others that are good for foot traffic? Um, 
I, I, I think I mentioned that the, uh, the pussy toes, once those delicate little flower stalks died back, though that can take a certain amount of foot traffic. And we'll be getting to a few others a little, a little bit further down the line. Okay. Um, one of our um, listeners had uh, rabbits destroy their flocks uh, subulata, do you have a recommendation for a replacement? Oh boy. Um, well, that, that silene, the, the uh, silene caroliniana, the wild pink, that might be one to try. That grows just a tiny bit taller. It doesn't have the same needle-like foliage that the, uh, that the moss phlox does, but it is evergreen foliage. Um, so that might be one to, to give a try. Okay. You use the term lean soil. What do you mean by that? That means a, a soil where you're not adding a, a, a lot of fertilizers. In fact, native plants really don't need the kind of fertilization that many of us associate with, with gardens. Uh, it, it, they need a, a drier kind of a soil. Many of these plants naturally will grow in um, in roadside or meadow conditions and those are, are usually sunny and drier conditions and our, our native plants tend to have pretty substantial root systems so they don't need to have a, a lot of the the nourishment necessarily up at the top they want a drier kind of a soil if they have a, a heavily mulched or a, a heavily fertilized soil condition they actually will get kind of floppy Okay. Um, do you have a recommendation as best time to dig up uh, the rosettes of robin plantain and replant? Um, I, I, think, I think you could do that in the, in the early spring as they're starting to form. Uh, now they are evergreen, so you, you might actually be able to do, to do it now, and then they could, could, could kind of reroot and get established before the cold weather comes in their new location. Okay. Um, Blue-eyed grass, does it self-sow or do you need to do anything to propagate it? That one will, will expand a little, a little bit uh, with, with its clumps and I believe it also does some, some self-seeding. But, but with some of these plants, if you want to see them spread a little more rapidly, you could do what I described with, that, with the wild pink. You, you take a, a basic clump of the plant and then in the springtime, you can actually uproot that clump and then uh, very gently dig it apart and you can actually get multiple smaller clumps to allow it to spread a, a little more quickly in your garden. Some of, the, some of the plants spread more rapidly than others. Those that have the stolons, the above ground um, spreading roots will, will spread uh, fairly rapidly. Okay, are there any mountain mints that tolerate shade? Um, I, I believe the mountain mints tend to, to prefer more the sunny conditions. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about any, any others. I just mentioned this one particular one, Pycnanthema okay. rubicum, but there, there could be others that could, could take a little bit more um, shade. There were a couple of questions about lawns. One, are there good ground covers to replace lawn? And two, are there any that will um, fight or outcompete Japanese stilt grass? Oh boy, stilt grass is, is a very invasive plant. So uh, that's going to be a big challenge. When we get a little bit further on, I'll, I'll talk about a couple plants that, that could be used as, as a lawn alternative. And you may, uh, want to look at, if you haven't seen it already, uh, another presentation that I gave on native grasses, sedges, and rushes, where I do talk about a couple of grass species that can be used as a replacement for the traditional turf grass. Okay. Another person has trouble with English ivy and mosquitoes and wants to know if you have any recommendations for a mosquito repelling ground cover that would work in clay soil? Uh, we'll be getting to some good examples um, in, in, a little, in a little bit. Some of, the, um, some of the evergreen ground covers that I'll be talking about. Um, I've learned some really good techniques for, for uprooting 
um, English ivy. And this was demonstrated at an invasive poll by our extension agent, uh, Kirsten Conrad. It works really well if you've got a team of people. One person will actually take um, a, a garden tool, a, a particular kind of shovel. It's especially useful when you have one with a jagged edge and come in at about a 45 degree angle at the soil, at the roots. And the second person will actually take what's, what's being uprooted, not pull it away, but actually roll it up almost like a rug. And the, the, second, the, the first person continues to keep digging at those roots as the second person does, does the rolling. So that can be a great way to, to, uh, to get rid of the English ivy. When you take it up, you're not going to want to put that in, in the organic waste or, or compost. The, the English ivy can reroot very easily from the smallest section. So you want to actually bag that up and, and put it out with, with the trash. English ivy is particularly problematic when it's allowed to grow up our trees. Not only is it choking the trees, but when English ivy goes vertical, it begins to flower. When those flowers are pollinated, it forms fruit. Then birds will eat that fruit and spread it even further abroad. So good for you for working to uh, replace that. And I'll be suggesting a few replacements as we get a little further on. Okay, that's, uh, oh, one more, Elaine, are, do, is there something you'd recommend for a really moist uh, situation that stays kind of damp all the time? Yes, there's, there's a rush uh, that I'll be getting to um, in, okay. as, we come, as we come along. So I'll try to remember to point out some of the plants that, that have been, uh, there have been inquiries about. Okay, we're good on questions, thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, let's actually move along right now to some of the grasses and rushes for sun. Now, as I mentioned, I've, I've discussed some of these already in one other talk, so I'll, I'll go through this a, a little bit more quickly. Um, the first really attractive grass is little blue stem. It's um, a warm season grass. That means it's a grass that's going to start growing a little bit later in the season and it will really become attractive as the season moves along. This is a bunching grass, um, so it's not going to spread as much by, by those rhizomes. Uh, it's really attractive. It has a foliage color that changes through the seasons from blue-green to kind of a tawny color and uh, it's very uh, supportive of wildlife. Um, it's a larval host, birds will eat the seeds, and it can actually provide wildlife cover. You can use it uh, as a ground cover on slopes. It can give you some nice uh, structure in a xeriscape setting, and you can use it uh, great uh, erosion control in meadows. Now here's a perfect example of a plant that would do well in wet conditions, and in fact it can even grow uh, in standing water up to four inches deep. This is common rush, Juncus effusus. It's an upright plant uh, with kind of a, a vase-like shape. It has these smooth spire-like stems. They're, they're evergreen and they look kind of bristly, but they actually are soft, giving its, its second common name, soft rush. It will flower uh, from July to September and it is, I've seen it used as the central component in a rain garden. And you can actually use it uh, on moist banks, uh, maybe a, along a, a stream bank for uh, erosion control. So a good example of something for wet conditions. Now this uh, particular grass is maybe the one of the most aggressive of the plants that I'll be talking about today. This is river oats, Chesmanthium latifolium. This is a cool season grass, so it's going to put out a lot of its growth very early in the season. It's upright and clumping, but it spreads both by rhizomes and by self-seeding. It has these really attractive seed heads that change color through the seasons absolutely beautiful with this uh, effect of backlighting and attractive in, uh, for, for winter interest with these seed heads. Now, a couple of locations where it actually 
could be very useful because of its more aggressive spreading tendencies. One would be if you had a hell strips type situation. This is right here in my neighborhood. Someone had just this very little narrow hell strip between their uh, fence in their front yard and the curb, and they just allowed it to grow up and down the fence. This is another example, not too far from me uh, in Arlington, where it's used very effectively. It's, it's pretty much the sole plant that's covering this, uh, this moist slope, and it's uh, very effective at controlling erosion there. So the point is, choose the right plant for the right place. If you don't want it to be uh, just a stand as a single plant in a landscape bed, don't plant it there, but it can really be a workhorse for you in this kind of a situation for erosion control. Uh, let's also move on to some native woody plants for sun. Uh, the first is creeping juniper. And it's a sprawling mat forming shrub. It's not that tall, six to 18 inches tall, but it spreads quite wide, five to eight feet. Uh, again, soil, uh, excuse me, full sun and moist uh, soil, but it can tolerate drought, poor and rocky soil. Now, a, an important thing to point out for this plant and one other uh, member of the uh, juniperus uh, genus, it is an alternate host for rust disease. So if you have a, a plant, uh, perhaps a, a shrub or a tree that is in the, uh, the apple or the rose family, examples would be hawthorns or service berries, the, the amelanchiers. You're not going to want to introduce this plant because it could spread to, to those plants and then the fruit of those plants will, will become diseased. It won't kill the plant, but it, it just won't be very attractive. So just, just uh, again, right plant, right place. So this plant will form a very dense, wide mat. Uh, here's an example in a hell strip in our sunny demonstration garden. It also could be good for foundations and rock gardens or for controlling erosion on slopes. It has a really attractive green to blue-green foliage and that will turn purplish in the winter. This is one of my favorite woody plants. It's the Grow Low cultivar of fragrant sumac. The straight species grows maybe six or, or eight feet tall. I've, I've seen it growing in the forested conditions at Fern Valley at uh, the National Arboretum. But this Grow Low cultivar is really only about 18 to 36 inches high, but can spread quite wide. It's uh, absolutely perfect for full sun uh, conditions and again, those, those dry soil situations. It has glossy aromatic leaves, and although it is a sumac, it has non-toxic foliage. It, it even looks a, a, a little bit like uh, poison ivy, but, but it is not toxic. It has these really attractive male catkins from summer through winter, and then these beautiful female flowers that will appear in the spring attracting pollinators. And when those flowers get pollinated, they form this delicious fruit for birds. This plant is really attractive because of its brilliant fall color. It spreads both by tip rooting. Uh, when a, a branch touches the ground, it actually can re-root and it can sucker, that is forming another branch from the, from the main base. Uh, here it's used really attractively as a hedge-like ground cover. This is at Green Spring Gardens here uh, locally in Northern Virginia. Uh, one of my master gardener friends uses this as a green mulch. It works really well. Uh, so this is a fabulous example of something that you might want to use an evergreen green mulch to use under trees and shrubs. Great replacement for English ivy. You can use it uh, as a foundation plant. And here's an example. Um, I introduced this um, in a church parking lot. There were these very narrow, maybe three foot wide, steeply sloped hell strips, really hot conditions. And we planted a number of these plants. And over the years, it spread even more than this. So it's, it's a continuous bank, uh, really great uh, for those hot, dry conditions. Another plant, again, this is another one that's uh, fairly available in the general horticulture trade, is uh, St. John's wort. This particular one is 
specifically locally native, Hypericum prolificum. It is a compact, rounded shrub. It can grow one to four feet high. Again, you could pinch this one back to keep it at a slightly uh, shorter height. It has uh, very showy flowers. Now, interestingly, they don't have nectar, but native bees and surfeit flies will come seeking pollen. It has fine textured foliage, and that provides nourishment for some Lepidoptera. It has a very densely branched form, so it could be very useful uh, used en masse for erosion control, or you might want to use it just as a spreading ground cover in a wildlife garden. Another woody plant, this is another one uh, in the Juniperus genus, a uh, member of the Cypress family, is the gray owl a cultivar of red cedar. Red cedar, the straight species, is actually quite a tall tree, uh, growing 50, even up to 70 or 90 feet tall, a very attractive native tree. But this is a much shorter cultivar. It has a, is a vase-shaped uh, spreading habit, and it grows about two to three feet high, but again, spreading fairly wide. Again, this is another one that would uh, be a potential host for the rust disease, so you'd want to keep it clear from those uh, trees and shrubs that I mentioned earlier. This is evergreen. It's a dioecious, dioecious species. That means that there are separate male and female plants. The female flowers are really attractive here as seen in May. And when those are pollinated, they form these blue berry-like cones that uh, provide nourishment for birds. This plant has a kind of a silvery gray scale-like foliage, and it has been considered the best drought-resistant plant of any conifer that's native to the Eastern United States. It has graceful arching branches, really effective when massed, and it's great for dry, sunny conditions. Now we'll be looking at uh, some native ground covers that can uh, grow in both sun to shade conditions, four of these. The first is a plant that many people may actually consider kind of a weed, native violets. Now, I actually take advantage of the fact that they will show up in my garden and just multiply on their own. It's kind of a source of, of free plants. And there are, are multiple native species. It's a mounding plant about six to nine inches high. And as I said, can grow in a range of uh, sun conditions. Now, what I'd like to point out to you is that in addition to multiplying, it actually provides a, a lot of ecosystem services. Number one, all of these different uh, species, the common blue violet, um, and here is, is its uh, confederate alternate form, yellow, violet, and striped are all good sources of early spring nectar for our pollinators. And then the foliage uh, helps to serve as a larval host for up to 30 species of fritillaries, those very small, delicate butterflies, members of the Lepidoptera family. And if you allow it to spread, it can be quite a, a good ground cover, a natural woodland ground cover. I personally use it in, in slightly more formal conditions. This is at a woodland edge. I just use it under some woody plants. Another great uh, ground cover that, that can be used in a, in a range of conditions is golden ragwort. This is one that's highly recommended by the Audubon at Home program here in Northern, uh, nor, uh, Northern Virginia. It's a clump forming plant um, and it begins with these glossy heart-shaped basal leaves. Again, great uh, host plant for Lepidoptera. If you see the, uh, the buds, they have a purplish color and you might expect that the flowers would be purple, but in fact, they are bright yellow. They're a, a daisy-like uh, composite form. These are on flower stems that are about 18 inches high, so they reach uh, well ab above that basal foliage, and they're great as uh, nectar sources. Uh, I've seen them used in many, many different garden settings. This is a, a lovely ground cover setting at Meadowlark in a, in a woodland edge. 
here it's really impressive used on mass uh, at the nature conservancy garden now this uh, plant will spread both by self-seeding if you allow those those yellow flowers to go to seed and it will have basal offshoots but i find that if i cut off those tall flower stalks before they begin to form those white seed heads if i don't want it to spread if i cut those off I can have a pretty good control over its spread. Also, although it does spread with the offsets, they're very easy to uproot. And uh, you can give away uh, those up, uh, uprooted sections to, to neighbors if you like, uh, but, but it is easy, easy enough to control. So you can use it in a, a woodland garden. This is at Green Spring Gardens in their forested area. And here, this is down at the Norfolk Botanical Garden. They've actually used it as a green mulch on slopes or uh, for erosion control. So uh, in answer to that question about English ivy, um, another good example of a substitute. Uh, hairy alum root can take uh, sun to shade conditions. It has a rounded clumping form and these really lovely airy panicles uh, that, that go from June into the fall, attracting bees and butterflies. It has these large toothed leaves, and these will remain through a mild winters. And then these striking seed heads uh, that result from the pollinated flowers will actually last through to the next spring. You can use it en masse as a ground cover in a woodland garden or uh, as one of my master gardener colleagues does, just use it as an edger for paths. Again, something nice to surround shrubs. And our final example of uh, sun to shade perennials is golden Alexander, Zizia aurea. This is an erect branching plant. It grows from about 18 inches to three feet high in moist soil. And the outstanding thing about this plant, it's in the uh, carrot or parsley family. And it, uh, like those other plants, is a great host plant for swallowtail butterflies. With this uh, compound leaf structure, it looks quite a bit like bishop's weed, so it could be a great substitute for that. It has these flat topped flower clusters that are very easily accessible for pollinators for both uh, pollen and nectar. Here it's used, uh, this is an example, it's used as a green mulch um, at, at the Nature Conservancy Garden. Uh, this would be a great place if you had had English ivy here, this would be another good substitute uh, there. Um, and it, uh, here it is, I've used it as an edging in my layered uh, forested garden. Any more questions, Colleen? Absolutely, we have tons of questions. <laughs> okay. um, uh, I know you give a talk on this, uh, Elaine, but could you just tell people the difference between rushes and grasses? Yes, there's, there's a little mnemonic that, that's used for helping to, to make the distinction between grasses, sedges, and rushes. Sedges have edges, Gra uh, rushes are round, grasses are hollow right down to the ground. Now, uh, the, the sedges have edges means that the sedges actually have triangular stems. Grasses are, uh, that their stems are round and they are hollow and rushes have round stems, but they are pith filled. Okie doke, um, thanks. Um, you had mentioned a rush that's good for moist conditions and someone asked that you repeat that? Yes. That is the common or soft rush, Juncus, J-U-N-C-U-S, effusus. Uh, you should see that, I hope, on, on the handout. That's the one that's really good for those, uh, for those wet conditions. Okay. Um, should, uh, do you know what the lifespan of creeping juniper is? Someone is having trouble with the ends of the branches breaking off. Hmm. Uh, I've been working uh, in the Sunny Demonstration Garden since I certified as a, a Master Gardener volunteer back in 2013, and it's, it's doing very well there. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly what could be happening with that. But 
I will provide some, uh, some contact information at the end of the talk uh, for getting uh, answers to questions uh, about difficulties with plants, either uh, growing conditions or uh, pests, uh, insect pests or diseases. Okay, thank you. Um, should St. John's wort be pruned after the foliage dies? Uh, yeah, yes, I think that would be a good thing to do. Okay, um, someone's having trouble growing Allegheny spurge and partridge berry. Do they need a lot of sun? Uh, I think of, I'll be talking about both of those plants actually in just a few minutes. So maybe okay, let's save it. Let's talk about that in just okay. shortly. And the question about violets being able to push out a sarum or ginger plants? Um, I actually have them inter intermixed. Um, but again, those, those plants, the violets grow in clumps, and I find them fairly easy just to dig down and uproot that, that single cluster if you don't like the way it's spreading. I've, I've been successful in allowing it to intermingle to a certain extent. Okay. Um, how to get more hairy alum root? Do garden centers carry it? How do you propagate it? Uh, I will be giving some information on sources of native plants, but that would be one that uh, as, it, as, it, uh, as that basal clump forms in the spring, you, you could actually divide that and create multiple plants for yourself. But, but I'll give you some information uh, if you wanted to purchase native plants. At the okay, end. great. Um, do you recommend wild strawberry as a ground cover? Uh, not wild strawberry, but uh, well, I, I guess that could be one. I will be talking about barren strawberry, which is uh, a, another example. Yeah, I, I, yes, I think the wild strawberry could be a good a ground cover, actually. It, it, it's going to spread pretty, pretty rambunctiously with those long runners, but uh, yeah, that, that could be one. Yes, thank you for that suggestion. Okay, and the final question is, uh, when do um, golden ragwort plants bloom? The, the golden ragwort? Uh, I'm sorry, I rushed through that fairly quickly. Those bloom quite early in the spring uh, for several weeks in April. Okay, that's good for now. Thank you, Elaine. Okay, thanks, Colleen. All right, let's move along. We'll be talking now about shade-loving plants. We'll start again with the grow, uh, low growing ones, and the very first one is going to be partridge berry, Magella repens. This is a creeping prostrate plant. It's only a few inches uh, tall, and it grows in part shade to shade conditions. It likes moist soil, but it can tolerate dry soil and dense shade. Now, uh, as far as uh, growing conditions, I'll, I'll tell, talk about that in uh, one of the next slides. It has a uh, glossy rounded leaves and it, it will form a mat, but it does it fairly slowly. It's, it's not going to be one of the, of the more vigorous growing ones. Uh, it has these really charming paired flowers. You can see the joined buds right here. Uh, they will uh, appear as early as May and maybe continuing into July and will attract bumblebees. And those joined flowers will uh, form a, a single fruit the, the, the ovaries of those two plants will form a single uh, fleshy fruit that will form in July, but will actually last through into December and can be eaten by birds. Now, our uh, local naturalist, Alonso Abugadas, has pointed out that you want to plant partridge berry away from any competing plants. It's, it's not going to do well if it's intermixed with a lot of others. And you also want to plant it um, it's, it's more of a shade loving plant. So you want to plant it without a lot of deep leaf cover. So here it is in the forest, but as you can see, it's actually growing at the foot of this tree. So it, it isn't uh, where, where the leaf cover is extremely deep. Uh, the first time I ever saw this plant was, was growing in, in the garden that I grew up with as a child, and it was growing very uh, vigorously at the foot of an oak tree. So maybe look out for those particular conditions if you're, if you're having some, some trouble growing it. Another great low growing plant is wild stone crop. This is a native sedum. There are many uh, sedums grown, uh, some of them grown as steppables at the, at the uh, nurseries, but this is a native sedum. This one is not 
particularly steppable. It's, it's a, a, a more delicate plant. It's a prostrate and mat forming about two to six inches high. It has semi evergreen foliage and it's actually a succulent. And then in the early spring, it forms these delightful star like flowers. It's perfect for rock gardens, and this is how I've used it uh, as a ground cover under trees and shrubs. Now we talked a, a moment ago about the, the native wild strawberry. This is a uh, barren strawberry, uh, a different species, and the fruits of this particular plant are not edible. This one can grow uh, in part shade, and it tends to like a moister, uh, more humus filled and, uh, so and acidic soil. This one spreads by rhizomes, and when it does, it forms a fairly dense mat that can choke out weeds. It flowers from April to May. Uh, we talked about wild ginger a few moments ago. I think this one uh, can hold its own fairly well against the violets, but again, if, if you're concerned, then you can just uh, uh, uproot those. Uh, it is a deciduous plant, so that one's going to, going to die back, uh, but, but the foliage is, is lush when it is in, in the main part of the growing season. It has ha uh, satiny heart-shaped leaves and is the larval host for the pipevine swallowtail. These flowers, really charming, very unusual flowers, are actually hidden, tucked uh, beneath the foliage. And they're said to be pollinated by beetles, actually growing rather than fl uh, crawling rather than flying. It will spread slowly by rhizomes and could be uh, really nice to use on slopes uh, for erosion control. Now, uh, because it is deciduous, I tend to use it intermixed with other plants and I'll be pointing out what some of those other plants might be uh, in addition to violets as we go along. You could use it as a, a ground cover in a woodland setting. Uh, here it's intermixed with um, some uh, various sedges uh, used as an edging. This is uh, at the Nature Conservancy Garden. A really nice uh, iris, uh, in addition to the to the uh, to the iris family mem member that I mentioned before, the uh, the blue-eyed grass. Uh, this is dwarf crested iris. It's mound forming, about six to eight inches high. And it will spread the, the way uh, our other iris species do with these kinds of rhizomes. And, and like the, uh, the bearded irises, the, the other uh, more traditional garden irises that a lot of us are familiar with, this you also want to have the rhizomes close to the, to the soil surface. You don't want to bury those too deep. Uh, and that will allow them to spread and form their colonies. It has really charming flowers in April that will attract bees and hummingbirds. You can use it in borders. This is an example actually in uh, our herb garden at the Glen Carlin Demonstration Garden uh, in Arlington. And here it's attractive in a woodland garden. It's tucked in the back here and you, it's intermixed uh, with some ferns. And uh, I believe this is uh, white wood aster that I'll be talking about shortly. Another uh, brighter colored flower is green and gold. This is a mat forming and, and clumping uh, perennial about six to eight inches high, uh, growing in part shade to deeper shade. It can actually tolerate heavy shade. It has semi evergreen foliage and then these composite flowers from April to May. And then it, if you pinch those back, it may actually uh, flower uh, intermittently into the fall. It's a good nectar source for pollinators. It can spread by rhizomes uh, to form a nice weed-free mat. And I use it as a, an edging ground cover here in, in my uh, more formal garden beds. Uh, we talked earlier about moss phlox. There are many uh, species, native species of phlox. This one is creeping phlox, phlox stolonifera. So this one is going to spread in a slightly different way. 
it's it, of course taller than the the moss phlox and the moss phlox likes a bright sun this one prefers part shade to full shade it has really attractive flowers from April to May on those flower stalks. And as you can see, it's available in a wide range of colors. It's a great early season nectar source for a wide variety of pollinators. It, it uh, has these basal leaves. Uh, that, that's what's going to continue to, to remain as the, as the ground cover layer once the flowers have died back. And these leafy stems will actually creep along the ground with stolons to form colonies. You can use it in a woodland garden. Uh, this is a really attractive edging along a forest path. Uh, here it's used, I, I believe this was in Fern Valley at the uh, National Arboretum for a, a naturalized area. And here it is at Meadowlark, used intermixed with other shade loving plants. So here is Allegheny Spurge, which was mentioned in a question. This is the native Pachysandra, Pachysandra procumbens. It's actually native, uh, truly native, a little bit further south, but it grows, can be grown very successfully here uh, in the Northern Virginia area. It's a clumping plant, uh, grows about six to 10 inches high and can spread uh, one to two feet and can tolerate uh, a certain amount of drought and dense shade. The interesting thing about this uh, ground cover is the seasonal changes in the foliage. It starts out with these little whirls of uh, pale green, almost lime green foliage. And then uh, it, it forms th these mottled patterns on the leaves. This is at the same time that it's in flower. It has these uh, fragrant flowers in the early spring. And then as the season moves on, it takes on the, the solid green foliage color. It spreads to form colonies, so you can use it en masse, uh, I would suggest in a woodland garden setting. And it's a, a great replacement for the invasive Japanese Pachysandra. Here it's uh, used, uh, this is one of the, the gardens in North Carolina, the North Carolina Ar uh, Arboretum, used really effectively under trees. It could also be used near foundations. Foam flower is a really charming plant, a clump forming plant, uh, six to 12 inches high. And uh, this one, you want to be really careful about the, the soil conditions, not too dry, not too wet, kind of a, a Goldilocks in between situation. It has heart shaped lobed leaves that are evergreen in mild winters. And some of the cultivars actually have a, a really pretty uh, purple pattern to the foliage. It gets its name, foam flower, because of these airy flowers that bloom from April to May. And these will attract a, a wide variety of bees, uh, native flies, and butterflies. It spreads fairly quickly by stolons, and it's used really effectively as almost a, a, a running river of blooms uh, in woodland gardens. It could also be attractive in rock gardens, and you could use it en masse on slopes for erosion control. Moving on to some of our uh, taller native perennials for shade, uh, Jacob's Ladder, Polymonium reptans. It gets its name because of the, the way the, the leaves are arranged almost like a ladder on the stems. This is a mound forming plant and somewhat sprawling. It's about, uh, 12 to 18 inches high in part shade to full shade. And this plant will go dormant in, in drought conditions. It has really delicate fern-like foliage and then these showy flower clusters from April to May. Again, another great uh, pollinator attracting plant. It can spread through reseeding and uh, very nice to use in woodland gardens as a ground cover. May apple may be a, a plant a little a more familiar to some of you, Podophyllum peltatum. The one important thing to mention about this is that it is ephemeral. That means that it will be emerging in the early spring and last on into the summer, and then it will go dormant. It begins with these really little, uh, very interesting umbrella-like uh, leaves, and these will, will unfurl 
and underneath the leaves that have double stems, uh, these flat, excuse me, let me go back one slide, it will uh, form flowers uh, on the two-leaved plants from April to May. It uh, spreads to form a, a pretty dense colony, which is perfect for naturalizing. Here it's in, used in Fern Valley. Uh, this uh, other plant is Dicentra cucularia, uh, Dutchman's breeches. In fact, this uh, is a good illustration of how you would want to, uh, Dutchman's breeches is also ephemeral, but if you interplant uh, May apple with ferns and other species like Solomon's seal uh, or the Allegheny spurge, which is what I do in my garden, uh, it will form this really nice, very lush gr uh, ground cover in the spring, and then the other plants will, will fill in as it dies back in the summertime. White wood aster is uh, maybe one of the tallest of the perennials that I'm recommending. This is another one that you could pinch back to, to uh, have it grow at a slightly shorter height. This one uh, can grow in dry to medium soil and it actually tolerates uh, drought and heavy shade. It's another member of the aster family with those composite flowers from July to October. Uh, again, a great nectar source. This would be uh, for the fall season. And at the base of those flower stalks, it has these really attractive heart-shaped basal leaves. It spreads pretty vigorously by both rhizomes and seeds. Uh, and so you could use it spreading to control erosion in woodland gardens. This is how I've used it in my native plant garden. But I, I find it's easy enough to, to, to pull it where, where it spreads if I, if I don't want it to go beyond certain bounds. Uh, one of my friends uses it as a ground cover under trees. Here, uh, it's used at the National Arboretum in Fern Valley as an edging for pathways. Uh, any more questions at this point? Yes, we do. We have some more questions. Okay. Um, someone asked a question about what would you recommend as ground cover in shade in acidic soils, like under evergreen trees? Um, I, some of the, the ones that I've signaled as doing a little bit uh, better in acidic soil, um, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of these actually are forest species. Um, so, so they would, would be pretty good to, to try. They, they're forest species in those, uh, in those native conditions. Um, let's see, this one I think would be, would be a pretty good example. Um, let's see, which was the one that I was pointing out was, was good for acidic soil. Um, I think maybe the wild, the wild ginger. And I guess you might, you might also try the, uh, the partridge berry. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you would actually plant creeping flocks under mayapple or how would you make it happen? Uh, well, what I did in my garden was I actually started out with the, with the mayapple. I got some clusters of, of mayapple and then let, let that start to establish. Now, it, it has rhizomes and, and and when you dig, you may end up kind of breaking some of those rhizomes up, but then you could in fact move them to, to other spots that, where you'd like it to spread. And that will open up uh, a spot where you can dig a hole and, and interplant. What I do is I, I start with some of the other plants that I want to introduce in a, a fairly small form. I, I don't get a really big robust plant. I, so I'm trying to introduce fairly small plants uh, nested in between. Okay, um, someone asked if cultivars of mayapple are good for pollinators. I am not personally aware of any cultivars of, of that particular plant. In general, it's, it's best to, to uh, stick with, with the straight species of plants. Uh, this would be true of some of the perennials, for example, 
uh, some of some of the the asters. Um, one really big example is um, Echinacea, Echinacea purpurea, which has many many uh, cultivars available in the trade. The problem with cultivars is that if the flower form is, has been changed or the flower color has changed, it's not going to attract the same pollinators. Uh, if the flower becomes double or really dense, you won't have the, the large nectaries in the central cone of the flowers available. And therefore the flower is beautiful, it's ornamental for us, but it's no longer uh, serving the function uh, as, as a, a providing for, for our pollinators. Uh, if the foliage color has been changed, and this happens more, I think, with some of the shrubs, where the foliage is changed from the straight species green to uh, a purple foliage, for example, then it will no longer serve as a host plant. It won't, the chemistry, the, the total chemistry of the, the leaf has been changed, and it can no longer provide nourishment for those uh, caterpillars of the Lepidoptera. But I'm not aware personally of a cultivar of, uh, of May apple. Okay. Um, do you have any recommendations for shade plants in a hell strip? Uh, well, I, I guess I personally tend to think of hell strips as, as section with hot, hot, dry conditions. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, any of any of these that spread, if it's if any of the ones that I'm that I'm signaling as doing well in drier conditions, um, it as opposed to uh, dry shade, as opposed to dry sun. I think would be good. Um, I, I haven't necessarily always called out every one that takes dry conditions, but there, uh, if you watch the recording of this uh, of this presentation and go back and look at those text boxes, or if you refer to the fact sheets that I'm going to describe at the end of the talk, you can really zero in on the ones that are good for the dry shade, and and that would maybe fill that that particular type of hell strip condition. Okay, thank you. Um, Elaine, if you were someone who wanted to go about replacing an invasive ground cover like Vinca, how would you go about it? Well, I have to admit, I'm one of the people who started out, uh, I either inherited some of those, uh, those plants when I moved into my home or unknowingly introduced those plants because they are so widely available. We see our neighbors growing them and we see them uh, in the nurseries and we assume that, that, that they're a good choice. Uh, what if, if it's not that extensive, I actually will, will just dig it, dig the plant up. Um, I, I described how to do it with English ivy, which is maybe a, a bit more tenacious. Although if you have little remaining root sections um, of the, of the of periwinkle, then, then that could, could regrow. But I would just try to, uh, to dig it up and then, then come up with uh, maybe initially more slightly more widely spaced um, native plants and and then allow them to to fill in um, if you have just a, a, a huge carpeted blanketed area let's say maybe a whole hillside of a certain plant and you feel that it's just too ambitious a project or you don't have the funds to afford that many replacement plants maybe just decide to undertake a certain replacement of a certain portion of that of that slope or that area and then the next year come back and try to continually replace with more and more of the native species yeah, I think that's good. Okay. How about any recommendations for planting under fruit trees, such as persimmon or Asian pears? Uh, I don't have, I don't know of any that, that would be specific for that kind of situation. I think um, the barren strawberry might be a really attractive one. Yeah, okay. Um, how about planting under a birch tree that's on a slope? Uh, well, I think any of the ones that I've signaled as, as being good for slopes, uh, the, you would, the birch trees, if you're thinking about river birch, they are plants that tend to like moisture conditions. So just look for the ones that, that, that prefer those, those moisture soil conditions. 
Okay, that's good on the questions. Thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, let's see, we've got about 10 more minutes, so I'll try to move along here. Uh, first, we'll be looking at some ferns for shade. And uh, most people may not think of ferns as a good ground cover, but I think you'll see that they could be could fill that role. Uh, Christmas fern is attractive because it is evergreen and it has circu circular cascading slumps. It starts with these uh, silvery fiddleheads and then forms these attractive leathery lance shaped fronds with the stocking shaped leaflets that give it its name. Uh, you can use it uh, for foundations or in woodland gardens and here it's used in Fern Valley en masse uh, on banks to control erosion. Uh, this one is another fern I just absolutely love, marginal wood fern. It's got, uh, rather than a circular clump, it's got a vase-shaped clump about 18 inches to two feet high. Uh, this one prefers acidic soil but can tolerate a drought when established. It has really delicate, deeply cut leathery fronds. Uh, these attractive fiddleheads in, this, uh, in the spring, and you'll see the sori, the, the spore-bearing structures on the reverse side. Uh, I've seen it here at um, Meadowlark, just absolutely uh, in a, an entire carpet, and in my garden, I combine it with other shade-loving plants. Uh, a very robust plant, if you have the room for it, would be ostrich fern. Uh, it grows three to six feet high and five to six feet wide and uh, is going to prefer the more uh, moist to wet soil and tolerates dense shade. Uh, this is the one fern that, where the fiddleheads are edible. And as these sterile fronds unfurl, they, they are the ones that, that form that big vase-shaped clump. Uh, they can provide protective cover for wildlife. Then in the summer, these fertile fronds, these separate fertile fronds will appear and they will last on through the winter. They will be dry. They'll look like this the next spring and they will release their spores to, uh, to reproduce. They are absolutely gorgeous. Uh, if you use them to set off your spring bulbs, you can use them. Another great example uh, in moist conditions beneath uh, shrubs and trees. You can intermix them with other perennials. And here it is at Winterthur, an entire carpet in this moist woodland. Looking really quickly at some grasses and sedges. Uh, this is a great grass, uh, Pennsylvania sedge, a great grass for dry shade. Now, some people have uh, mentioned this as an actual uh, grass turf grass replacement. I wouldn't consider it quite that robust. It can't really take that amount of foot traffic. But let's say you have uh, a, a dry uh, forested conditions where grass isn't going to grow. You could grow it there and then use stepping stones uh, as your means of, of foot traffic. So it, it, it could give you a grassy look like this um, it, by spreading, but you're just not going to want to walk on that. Dogs couldn't run on that. It just can't take that kind of treatment that the regular turf grass can take. Uh, Appalachian sedge is a more robust uh, sedge. Rather than spreading so much, it has dense mounted tufts, uh, really attractive inflorescences in the spring, fine textured foliage, but, but more robust tufts. And here, uh, it's used very effectively um, for soil stabilization and erosion control. And I use it myself uh, as a nice edging along paths under shrubs in a, in a shadier setting. This sedge, uh, plant and leaf sedge, is the most ornamental of the sedges. Um, it grows a, about one to two feet across. Uh, it tends to prefer slightly moister conditions, but uh, can tolerate dry shade once it's established. And this one is evergreen. Has these really interesting uh, strap-like pu uh, puckered leaves with really prominent veins. And that's how it gets its uh, second common name, seersucker sedge, great larval host for the butterflies. Now here you can see it used uh, as uh, an edging plant. It will colonize, but very slowly via rhizomes. Uh, it's used here on a bank for erosion control and a fabulous replacement for invasive liriope. A, bo a bottle brush grass is a cool season grass, a clump forming grass, 
and it uh, has these really interesting, very distinctive uh, inflorescences, giving it its name, bottle brush. Absolutely spectacular, uh, used as a ground cover when it's massed in colonies at woodland edges. Now here's an example of a plant that is covering ground, but it's taller. It's going to be more like three or four feet tall. Really pretty as it changes color uh, through the seasons. And then finally, uh, one last plant, uh, a woody plant. This is Virginia creeper. This is a deciduous vine, and this can grow up to uh, 30 or 50 feet uh, along the ground and five to 10 feet high. Uh, you could use it in a, a range of conditions from sun to, to shade. It tolerates uh, even heavy shade. Now, the important thing to point out about this plant uh, is that you do not want to let this grow in buildings. You really don't want these uh, these vines, certainly English ivy, you don't want you don't want the vines growing on buildings because they can be damaging to to wood and to, to brick. Now Virginia creeper, most people may not even realize it has these very subtle flowers uh, and they will uh, when they're pollinated form this fruit in the fall. One very attractive feature of Virginia creeper is this beautiful, brilliant foliage in the late fall. Uh, this picture was taken at Bartholdi Garden in Washington, and they had it growing on the ground, and then uh, from this particular bed, just let it grow decoratively on the rock wall. I've also seen it used to, to cover uh, old stumps of trees and uh, on banks. You can just uh, let it grow where you would let uh, English ivy or invasive winter creeper grow as a ground cover. Uh, before we take our final uh, round of questions, I want to mention some important resources. Uh, I've explained that I'm speaking both on behalf of Virginia Cooperative Extension, the Arlington Alexandria unit. For those of you who are perhaps attending from, from other regions, other states, there are uh, Cooperative Extension units in your state, and so you could uh, pose any questions that you have uh, to them. Here locally, we provide uh, scientific uh, science-based information uh, from our land-grant colleges uh, via uh, several means. We do it, uh, it most times of year where we've been able to do it with plant clinics, but at the present moment, uh, those, those are, are, are closed. They usually take place at farmers markets. We do, uh, all, uh, in fact, have a help desk and our local address is MG, for Master Gardener, A-R-L for Arlington, A-L-E-X for Alexandria at gmail.com. So questions you have, uh, general gardening questions, uh, concerns about uh, diseases and pests can all be addressed via email uh, to that help desk. We have uh, five different demonstration gardens where you can see the, some of the plants that I've been talking about in addition to many others and the addresses of those are given on the website for Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia, mgnv.org. And we will be continuing to offer classes like this one every Friday uh, and recordings of any classes that you may not have been able to attend in person, uh, closed captioned versions of those classes are also available on the website. So uh, MGNV, Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia, is a nonprofit support group for uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension. We have this website with uh, weekly uh, gardening articles. And the most important thing I'd like to mention from the website is can be found under the plants menu uh, here on the website. And on that, uh, in that section, you will find in fact sheets on the invasive species, the invasive ground covers that I've highlighted. And if you go to those, you can follow links that will take you directly to the fact sheets that we've prepared for a good number of the native plants that I've been discussing throughout the talk today. Uh, where to see native plants are our Master Gardener demonstration garden. Uh, are good locations, and I've mentioned many of these other uh, locations throughout the talk. Meadowlark, the Nature Conservancy Garden, 
uh, Fern Valley, especially at the National Arboretum, the U.S. Botanic Garden, and Green Spring Gardens. And finally, where to buy native plants. I highly recommend that you go to the Plant Nova Natives website. They have a listing of the year-round sellers who deal exclusively in native plants. These are going to be, they're highly reputable sources. They're going to be really outstanding sources of native plants for you. Now, in normal years, uh, master gardeners themselves would be selling at the large green spring plant sale in the spring. Uh, but many of those sales have not taken place this year. So you may want to contact them. Several of them, um, Earth Sangha and Nature by Design are actually located right here in Northern Virginia. And others are, uh, are also uh, can, can be reached in other parts of Virginia. So I think we're ready for our final round of questions, Colleen. All right, Elaine, we just have a few. One person asked if you know about any uh swapping or sharing uh, organizations or sites for native plants? Well, one, one place that you can go, uh, in addition to the ones I've mentioned, is uh, Green Spring Gardens. The, the uh, Virginia Native Plant Society has a, 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 a strong relationship with Green Spring Gardens, and they maintain propagation beds uh, right there behind the Green Spring Horticulture Center throughout, um, throughout the year. And in fact, right now, uh, if you go to the Green Springs website, you will see information. I think it's every Wednesday. They are trying to, in fact, sell all of the plants they've been propagating this year, clearing away uh, the, all of their inventory of plants through October. So that would be uh, a, another good source of, of local plants and very reasonably priced. Okay, thank you. Um, another person asked, at what depth should you plant a fern? A fern? Well, you're, uh, you're going to want to, to bury that entire root ball, so uh, it depends on how large a fern you're getting. Most of the ferns I've gotten have been planted maybe in, in one gallon containers, so you're going to want to dig down maybe uh, a, about a foot, and you want to have the crown of the fern, the, the spot from which the fronds are growing, you're going to want to have that at ground level. So however deep you need to bury to get that crown at the ground level is, is how deep you want to go. Okay, and final question, does Virginia creeper hurt a tree if it grows up it? Uh, my understanding is that it's not going to, to do the choking that, that English ivy does. It, it's, it, it attaches to the, to the bark, but it's not going to, to do the, the strangling that the English ivy does. Um, I personally would, would use it more, uh, in fact, I do use it in my garden. Uh, I'd let it grow up some, some fences, not on my house, but on uh, a fence, and then let it sprawl as, as a ground cover. But I, I, think, I think it's not, uh, uh, not going to be as problematic as, as the ivy is. And some of the, some of the other um, vines can get very, very heavy. So it's, okay. not, it's, the, it's the weight uh, plus the strangling action of, of those vines that's so problematic for our trees. Okay, that, that's it for the questions. I just wanted to tell you, we've had many, many comments, a lot from Master Gardeners, thanking you for this wonderful presentation, and also many comments on the beautiful photos. And I don't think people know that you took the bulk of them. So uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're welcome. These photos, uh, they're part of a huge library, maybe about 10,000 photos that I've taken since I began. Uh, work as a, a Master Gardener volunteer. Uh, many of these were taken in my own yard or the, the, the gardens of other Master Gardener friends and the remainder were taken on walks around neighborhoods and in all of the gardens that, that I've mentioned. So I'm very glad to, to share those and, and this information about native plants with everyone. Again, as uh, Leslie mentioned, this session is being recorded. I will personally do the closed captioning and within about a week or so, it will be available on the Master Gardener website, mgnv.org. You'll look under the um, 
public education uh, menu tab. You'll look down for Master Gardener Virtual Classroom. Uh, uh, this particular class will be under the sustainable landscaping category. We also have recordings of sessions on best management practices, for example, taking care of your lawn, composting, and uh, lots of classes on urban agriculture, uh, vegetable growing. So thank you so much, everyone, and happy growing. Thank you, Elaine. Take care. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Leslie.